Hey, good morning. Welcome. It's Christmas week. That's awesome. I love it. I'm so glad to see everybody who's in the room. Hello, everybody in the room. I really appreciate everybody tuning in at home. Uh, even in the room here, we're still continuing to sit at tables and we're asking people when you come into the building to wear a mask until you're seated with the people who you came with. We're trying to continue to take precautions um, and also gathering and seeing people eyeball to eyeball and uh, we had a work day here yesterday I talked to one of the families who's here helping out and they said we liked it it was fun that's what I've been trying to tell everybody like yes it is fun it is fun to come and help out and this place is being transformed by people who are willing to uh, to catch the vision and uh, and and have some fun together and do some work so thank you everybody who's doing that I I'm excited for the people who are going to come Christmas Eve and see the uh, see the Christmas decorations, and I, I'm just I'm excited. I'm also excited to be a part of a church where it's Christmas week, and today I'm teaching about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and everybody's like, "Okay, cool." Like <laughs> I love that we have the kind of church where we can do the Christmas apocalypse series, and you know, hey, as long as we're in God's Word, then uh, then we're good. Um, I also want to let you guys know about some fun things that are going on. Um, if you're still nervous about coming to a, a gathering, even a, a limited number of people like this, they're going to control the number of people who come in and donate blood in this building on January 13th. That's a Thursday from 2 to 6 o'clock. 
We'd really like you guys to consider getting involved in that. The blood center contacted us specifically and said we have a really high need right now and if you guys could help us out. So I'd love that they recognize that we're people who care about our community and who do want to help. So uh, as we talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, one thing I want to remember is that we are called to be a people not who are trying to conquer and have power over other people, but people who serve. And a blood drive is a good way to do that. Uh, we're here to bring healing, and a blood drive is, is a good way to do that. So uh, hopefully we're going to see a good turnout for that. It's really up to you. So check that out. We are continuing in the book of Revelation. We are, we have crossed over into, okay, now we're getting to like the end time stuff. We're not hearing about what is at the end. We're just hearing about what leads up to it. And that's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Before we enter into that, let's pray. God, it is your word. This is your time. Our hearts are yours right now. Our prayer is that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit says. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, people in the room are taking notes on worksheets. It's a good thing. It helps you kind of organize in your thoughts because there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're talking about the four horsemen. So you can take, take note of who are those four horsemen? What are the colors that represent them? What are the things that they do? We're also uh, seeing the seals are going to be broken. We've heard that there are seven seals that are uh, holding a scroll shut, the scroll that tells what is going to happen in the future. So we've got four horsemen and seven scrolls, and there's a lot of math here. So it's good to write down notes as we go. Uh, and we are in the Christmas season. I don't want to forget that. And for some of us, we are just, uh, we're just loving it. It's just warm. We're excited. For some of us, we're stressed out about certain things. Uh, as I've been preparing this message, I kind of think, you know, sometimes when you've got uh, uh, like you're, you're a cold or something, you're just feeling generally sick and that's all you can really think about until you stub your toe. And then that distracts you from all the, all the cold and everything because there's that intense pain. Um, so if you've been distracted by stress uh, over Christmas, you're about to get a, a stubbed toe. As we talk about the, the coming horsemen of the apocalypse is going, I mean, it's so intense that hopefully by the end of this message, you're going to go, you know what? That stress is nothing. We've got way bigger things coming down the road. We've reached an important point in the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus, the king opening the seals, Jesus opening the lamb that was slain, showing the future events that are coming. So if you imagine the excitement and anticipation of opening a Christmas gift this week and just multiply it by a million, that's like what John is experiencing as he's in the throne room of God and he was weeping because no one was qualified to break the seals and open the scroll, like opening this gift. And now there is someone who is qualified. The lamb who was slain is worthy to open this. So he is in high anticipation. John gets to see God's plan for setting the world right. He's been imprisoned for his faith. He's under a materialistic and greedy empire. His fellow disciples of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire are being pr pressured to conform. They're being persecuted. When will the faithful saints experience some relief? When will Jesus rule with justice and bring peace on earth? John ends up finding out. It's going to get worse before it gets better. As we read in Revelation chapter 6, Then I saw the Lamb. When the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. So remember, the four living creatures around the throne. So one of them says, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out 
conquering and to conquer. Historians, when you read their commentaries about what's happening in the book of Revelation, they would have recognized this rider on a white horse who carries a bow and has this crown of victory. They would have recognized this rider as a, a Parthian. Uh, this is how a Parthian would have been described. And Parthians were this uh, warrior people on the edge of the Roman Empire, and they had the reputation of being warriors because they had actually defeated the invading Roman army on two different occasions had stopped the Romans from expanding their kingdom. And one of the ways they did that is they had this cavalry that was extremely skilled at firing a bow from horseback while riding. This was a very uncommon thing to be able to do, and the Parthians used it to their advantage. So they were known to ride white horses, Seeing a bow, people in the first century would have gone, oh, these are... <laughs> so this rider, this white horse represents power, war, conquering. The human heart is bent towards conquest, is bent towards winning. Uh, I had a friend invite me over to like play ping pong on Wednesday night. And I don't really play ping pong, um, so I wasn't super competitive. There were guys there who were, though. It was in their heart to conquer. I, I remember just volleying with, with, uh, with, with one guy, and I said to the other guys, you know, volleying is just before you actually play. I said, so when should I tell him that I don't actually play ping pong? And one of the guys said, oh, he knows. Because <laughs> he, he, he's that competitive. So we get a taste of that competitive spirit, that conquest. Uh, but we know we keep it in check, too. We don't actually want to hurt people most of the time. Remember when I said the most important question uh, it, when we see terrible things happen, the most important question is not how could a person do such an awful thing the important question is, what is keeping us from doing more awful things, and how can we get more of that? Because we all have the capacity for evil in our hearts. What we see here is that God in his mercy has kept humanity's desire to conquer in check. The Lamb's removal of the first seal is the removal of God's restraint that thing that keeps us from doing the impulses in our hearts. There will be a day when God says, okay, have it your way. And conquerors will conquer. Throughout history, including in the Roman Empire, and if you're a Star Wars fan, in the Galactic Empire, conquerors said their objective was peace and order, right? Like, I will conquer these lands in order to make them cooperate together. So it, the plan is an emperor wants to keep peace, but it's a, it's a false peace. And what we see is that the second seal ensures that conquerors will not hold on to peace and order Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So we've seen the white horse of conquering. And now we're seeing the red horse of civil war, of neighbors killing neighbors. And again, we see that this is God lifting restraint. He lifts peace and allows humanity to have their way. Some of my favorite stories, you know, I mentioned Star Wars and there's the you know, the whole Marvel universe, and yet I enjoy these, and I get excited about it. I have fun watching, and essentially, 
somebody kind of ruined them for me when they said, um, isn't this really uh, just kind of saying you can solve your problems by punching? Uh, and, and then I started to realize, oh, yeah, that's what they're doing all the time. Uh, it kind of ruined it for me a little bit. But we celebrate the uh, advancing of a mission or a plan uh, by fighting, by war. And yet the truth is that war rips apart families. It permanently scars and traumatizes people. It opens the door for greater suffering than most of us can imagine. That is what is happening in the world today and what is going to happen to a greater extent when God says, have it your way. Which brings us to the third seal, the black horse, famine. Verse 5, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So when people and resources are co-opted for war, they are not available to feed a family. So with the conquering happening and then the civil war happening, resources are being used up. The scale symbolizes resources becoming so scarce that food will have to be rationed out by weight. A denarius in the first century was equal to a day's wage. What a working person got for one day of work, a quart of wheat was enough food for a working person for a day. Three quarts of barley would be the inferior grain. So if you needed to feed more people in your household, with your day's wage, you could get three quarts of barley for a small family. So you're working all day just to get enough food for that day. Certainly there isn't enough food for rent <laughs> or, or, or to feed your uh, any animals that you, or livestock that you might have. Uh, you, you certainly wouldn't have any money for entertainment or clothing or medicine or generosity. So there will come a day where a day's labor gets a day's food, and there is nothing to spare. This phrase, do not damage the oil and wine, is a little bit weird to us. It would have been meaningful to the audience in the province of Asia. See, olive trees and grape vines have a much deeper roots than grain, so they can survive drought better. Within John's lifetime, John who wrote this, there was a famine in Rome where the emperor commanded cities to pull out their vineyards, half their vineyards, take them out and replace them with grain so that we can increase food production. And in the province of Asia, there were uh, like major revolts against that because so much of their income came from the production of wine. And vineyards take a long time to establish so to not damage the oil and the wine suggests that even though the average working person won't be able to afford the essentials in this famine, there will still be people who will pay you for the luxuries. So don't damage those other crops that can produce some income for you. You, you don't live on oil. You don't live on wine. But don't damage those because someone is going to pay you for them. So in the events leading up to the end of the world as we know it, there will be conquering, there will be civil war, there will be famine. Then the fourth seal, verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. Now there are some translations, if you look back at the, at the Greek, this would be like a pale 
green color. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence. Another word for that would be plague. And by the wild beasts of the earth. So interestingly, the name death is the Greek word Thanatos. Yes, if you shorten it, it's Thanos. See, geeks do their homework, all right? Um... Death, Thanatos. So the fourth rider is released to bring death to a fourth of the earth by four methods. This kind of goes along with uh, the, the, one of the patterns in Revelation of the number 12. Like, I don't know if God did it that way to help the people uh, who first heard it remember what's going to happen. So fourth rider, a fourth of the earth. Death by four methods. And this revelation is loaded with the number seven and the number 12. The four ways people die, the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts are found in the Old Testament. So people who had read the Old Testament, this would help them remember too because they had seen this before in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21. Now this is what the sovereign Lord says, how terrible it will be when all four of these dreadful punishments fall upon Jerusalem. War, famine, wild animals, and disease destroying all all her people and animals. If these events were to take place today, we would experience the death of about 2 billion people, billion with a B. So far in almost two years of COVID-19, we've lost 5.3 million people to death related to COVID-19. That's a huge number. It is tiny compared to 2 billion. Remember, this is not the end. This is only the beginning of the end. How are supply chain issues and the economy and health care and mental health and education, how are they going to be affected when the death toll is nearly 20 times what we've seen with COVID-19? We're not even seeing God's wrath yet in these seals being opened up. We're not seeing Satan's attacks. All we're seeing is the removal of God's restraint on the human heart. Merry Christmas. Now, a disciple of Jesus is not someone who has to face death without hope. This doesn't mean a lack of compassion. This doesn't mean shrugging our shoulders and saying, oh, well, 2 billion people. Oh, well, 5.3 million people. Whatever. Everybody dies. Shrug your shoulders. We're to have compassion on people. God has compassion on people. It means having a higher perspective where you don't hear this and think about death And be afraid that everything's over, that everything ends, that you you have hope because of Jesus Christ. So the four horsemen, if we think about conquering, it's in the human heart to conquer, yet it is in a disciple's commands to serve, not to conquer, to give power under rather than power under. Over. So even as we know these things are going to happen, we know that the church, that the disciples of Jesus need to be swimming upstream as they happen. Civil war. Jesus doesn't give us the opportunity to say, I have hate in my heart, so I'm going to uh, attack someone else. I'm going to hate something. He says, no, no, no. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. So even as civil war is going to happen, disciples of Jesus need to practice loving now. In the midst of famine, in the midst of scarcity, disciples of Jesus practice generosity and don't wait for something bad to happen. Practice now so that you're prepared. And in the face of death, we are people 
who continue to have hope. That's what a disciple of Jesus does. What this says to me is, we can't think of the vision of this church to be to make the world right. The world is going to get very wrong. We need to be a, a swimming upstream against the sinfulness of the world, even as the restraints come off, even though we know we're not going to prevent conquerors from conquering. We're not going to prevent civil war. We're not going to prevent these things from happening. We've got to practice now swimming upstream against them. What the revelation of Jesus the King shows us is that rather than the people of the world voluntarily giving up their rights and honoring God with their lives, the world will succumb to sin. So why? Why even try? Itziak Stern was a Polish-Israeli Holocaust survivor who in 1939 advised Arthur Schindler, a member of the Nazi party, to purchase a previously Jewish-owned factory where Schindler could make more money if he employed Jewish slave labor. Stern is the character played by Ben Kingsley in the movie Schindler's List, and he did not have the power to stop the war. He did find a way to prevent some people from being sent to concentration camps where millions suffered and died. Even though we are powerless to prevent the wars and the suffering predicted in Revelation, we have a clear call from God to hold fast, to persevere, to be a light, to share the good news of the kingdom and make disciples of all nations. I want to focus in on that good news for a moment. And we're kind of holding two things in, in a, a bit of tension where we've got Christmas, the coming of Jesus. And then we've got Revelation, and we're at the, the coming of the four horsemen. And we've got this light and, and, and beauty. And then we've got this kind of chaos and disorder. I want you to think about those things as I read words that the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Disciples gathered in Rome, in the center of the empire. He's speaking to people who have understood that God offered his Holy Spirit, that he gave his Son so that their sins could be forgiven, so that they could be made right with God. And after explaining all of that in this letter, he moves on to this in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. He says, what should we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Now that we've seen the throne room in Revelation, we can imagine that even better than the people who first read this could imagine it because they hadn't had that revelation from John yet. But to imagine it is Christ Jesus who died for us, was raised to life for us, and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. And we continue in verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Think about the four horsemen. Think about how the world is going to get darker before the light. As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. 
Paul says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Most translations say we are more than conquerors in him. Think about those four horsemen again. There will be a time where the human heart is unleashed and where conquerors will conquer. And the promise to someone who has recognized Jesus came from heaven, he became man so that he could die in our place. Someone who believes that his death and resurrection forgives our sins, gives us new life. We are more than conquerors. We don't need what our, our human appetites offer to us because we already have something better. Verse 38, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That being true, what do we have to worry about with these four? horsemen this is not something for us to be afraid of or worried about we have already been taken care of by God even as we may be asked to endure these things he's given us everything we need in order to do that and as you think about enduring conquerors coming in changing your government changing the rights that you have as you think about civil war happening and people rising up against those conquerors and people fighting against people to the point that they're killing each other. As you imagine famine and, and starving and scarcity, as you imagine death at a rate that we just have never seen before. What are you so worried about this Christmas? I mean, like, if you're stressed out about Christmas, just take a breath and relax. If God can carry you through that, maybe you should just enjoy your season a little more, huh? I mean, if you're really feeling stressed out right now, maybe it's time to get some perspective and say, the God who can hold me through that can certainly hold me through this and I can praise his name not because I feel like it but because he is worthy these are the opportunities that we have this Christmas season as we remember what Jesus did where he stepped down from his comfortable place in heaven from his th throne room and stepped into a smelly manger for you no matter what else happens this Christmas, you have been given a gift from God. It's good news. Let it hold you. Let him sustain you. Through the joys, through the troubles. We are his. What an amazing gift this Christmas. I'm looking forward to coming together with people in this room and a, a online Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock and just worshiping, just remembering who Jesus is, remembering the good news. And then next week, Sunday, you make a plan. I'm not doing nothing. I mean, on camera, in this room, uh, we're giving everybody uh, who who's works every weekend to make things happen here, we're giving everybody a break that Sunday. So figure out a plan on how can you reach out to maybe a family member, maybe a neighbor, maybe take a short passage of scripture from the book of Luke. Look in the book of Luke for the Christmas story and just ask the question, well, what does this teach us about God? What does it teach us about people? Maybe get people together and say, what are you most thankful for from 2021? It's a lot 
harder for some people to come up with an answer to that than what did you think stunk about 2021? But it's a good thing. It's a good question to ask. What are you thankful for that God did in 2021? What are you worried about in 2022? Let's pray about that. Maybe take some time next Sunday morning and have that kind of conversation. Be the church where you are. God knows we need to be the church wherever we go. As things get darker, the promise of Christmas is that the darkest days come right before the light. Let's remember that this Christmas. Go in peace. See you soon.